Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we are on the Gospel of Mark, the earliest gospel in the uh, evangelical tradition as contained in sacred scripture. So uh, what we'll be doing is hitting some of the focal points in Mark's gospel, uh, the issue of uh, uh, his primacy over Torah, uh, the issue of kosher, the Sabbath, the prophetic tradition, uh, the issue of uh, defilement, and then uh, in the second part, because this is a two-week program, the second part will deal with the uh, passion narratives as seen in Mark's gospel. So we welcome people uh, to the, to the uh, St. Francis preaching teaching schedule. What's fascinating in Mark's gospel, written about 69, 70 AD. Now, th there's a lot of scholarship based on this, namely, uh, <clears throat> who's, uh, for what purpose was the gospel written? Like any other, it was meant to preach the good news, meant to preach the words and works of Jesus as understood, discerned, reflected upon, and then later through authoritative interpretation proclaimed as God's saving word. So the audience is basically um, Hellenistic or Greek culture. So there are converts from Judaism, Hellenistic converts, and then um, um, Hellenistic uh, converts from Gentilism. So uh, it is a mixed community. And so the Gospel of Mark is the shortest of all of, of the four Gospels, okay? And so there, there are certain uh, attributional characteristics that makes Mark's Gospel different from John, Luke, or Matthew. You're going to find very quickly that in Mark's Gospel, Jesus is a very emotional, messianic, eschatological leader. I'm using big terms, but those are the terms that are used. Eschatology, namely the future hope of Israel, is one of the key factors in the Markan tradition. We're waiting for a Messiah, someone that will, re that will wonderfully redeem Israel from the clutches of the enemies of Israel. And in this particular case, it's the Roman Imperium. So at this juncture, we have Mark chapter one, verses one through six. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Now, what's fascinating, unlike Matthew and uh, Luke, uh, technically speaking, there's no genealogy because in Matthew and in Luke, there is a genealogy. Uh, and we find that that is not present in Mark. However, to be perfectly honest with you, Mark does have a genealogy. Namely, where does he come from? Well, in Mark's gospel, the beginning of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is he? The son of God. That is his genealogy. Unlike Matthew and Luke, where it, it, uh, uh, these, uh, these other two Gospels will trace the genealogy back to Adam or back to Abraham. In John's Gospel, he's simply the Son of God. And, and that is his title. That is, his, that is uh, the label that the Markan writer attributes to Jesus. And then right from the very beginning, this is classical Jewish writing. You want to show that how God has manifested himself historically in the life and heritage of Israel. He's now going to bestow who and what he is through his son, Jesus Christ, in the gospel message. This is what we call the secondary uh, sense of sacred scripture or, or, or another term is a fuller sense. Whenever I use the term sense of scripture, I mean, what do the words significate? 
What is their meaning? And how do we make it applicable? So what is the utter significance of the words that the writer uses to describe the activity of God, the activity of Israel, and in this case, the activity of Jesus himself. <laughs> so to show continuity that, that, that the God that reveals himself wonderfully to Israel is now going to reveal himself in a definitive way in his son, Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ, or Messiah, Messiah. That's who Jesus is. He is the son of God. Now, you have to also understand that the term son of God in the Markan or gospel tradition is a non-unifical term. That is to say, it doesn't have the same meaning. You can have one word with multiple definitional structures. You got to keep that in mind, okay? So for example, when Mark uses the term son of God, as opposed to John, is there a difference in meaning? Absolutely. So in the synoptic tradition of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, synoptic means parallel. When you line them up, they there's a certain pattern of um, similarity. Uh, John is not synoptic. John has its own literary device and literary tradition and heritage. But when you have Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a certain similitude in style and in content, okay? So in Mark's gospel, the beginning of the good news, the gospel, of Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of God. The Son of God here in the Markan tradition means one who is like God by way of moral attribution. That is to say, uh, if God asks you to be merciful and you are merciful, then that is a moral union. That's how you're like God. So if you in any way exemplify one of the attributes of God, that's called a moral union. So you are united with what is seen as a good because morality deals with that which is good, okay? So if God asks us to be merciful and just, and you are merciful and just, then you have a moral union with this merciful and just God. That's, that's what we mean by moral union. And in Mark's gospel, Jesus has a moral union with God. So the attributes that would be found in God are found in Jesus. However, and this is a major distinction here, uh, there's another way of looking at the term son of God other than by way of moral union. And the other way is to say of how is Jesus son of God, not by moral union only, good, good as that might be, but by divine union. Namely, as God is divine or as Yahweh or the father, Abba, is divine, so is Jesus. Very different from moral union. It's not attributional. Divine union means as God is divine, so is Jesus. So that's why in Mark's gospel, whenever you have the term Jesus as the son of God, it's by way of moral union. However, again, there's always exceptions to the rule, which I'll talk about later when we, when we get in to the passion narrative. So, who is this Jesus? He is foretold in the heritage and history of Israel through what we call the secondary sense or the fuller sense. So a fuller sense or a secondary sense is when someone in the New Testament 
such as Mark, will now quote something from the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures, either from the prophetic tradition or, or from the Torah or from the Psalms or from some of the historical books, okay? <clears throat> Whenever a New Testament writer quotes something from the Old Testament or what we call the Hebrew scriptures, that is a secondary or a fuller sense. And that means that the meaning that the Old Testament verse has in and of itself receives a fuller or a secondary meaning later on by a New Testament writer. That's why it's called the fuller sense. So what's something that God begins in the Old Testament now receives a new significant meaning, interpretation, or understanding in the New Testament, the Old Testament to the New Testament. So we read as follows. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. That's from Isaiah, but not only from Isaiah, is also from Malachi chapter three, verse one. This is what we call a conflation. Yes, I'm using all sorts of words today, but you might as well get used to it because that's how we study sacred scripture. So at this particular juncture, Mark will quote Isaiah chapter 40, verse three, and then combine it with Malachi chapter three, verse one. That means there is a conflation. Two separate, see, two separate passages co-joined into one, which now expresses a new meaning or a new significance. This is something that's present even in the Old Testament. There are writers of the Old Testament scriptures or the Hebrew scriptures that uses <coughs> perhaps the uh, prophet Isaiah or Hosea or Jeremiah or Ezekiel will quote something from the Torah. And so again, so you can have a fuller sense of scripture or a secondary sense of scripture, even in the Old Testament. But for our sakes, uh, as we read for the gospel of uh, St. Mark, the fuller sense here means Mark takes something from the Old Testament and now applies it to Jesus in some way. And in that some way is that uh, Mark is saying, there is going to be a time in which someone's coming before the Messiah to prepare the way of the Lord. And who is this person? Well, he's the later what we'll term as the eschatological prophet, the prophet of future hope, the prophet of future revelation, the one who says, What you've been waiting for is now going to appear, eschatology, future hope in the life of Israel. Okay, so at this point, let's now turn to uh, the baptism of Jesus. So this is uh, Mark chapter one, verses nine, to 11, the baptism. Now, John the Baptist is the eschatological prophet, the one who's come to prepare the way of the Lord as seen in Malachi and as seen in the book of the prophet Isaiah. Well, that, per <coughs> that person is the fact John. And so John preaches and teaches and Jesus comes to be baptized by him, okay? So in 
Mark chapter 1, verses 9 and 11, we read as follows. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. Now, again, Mark wants to place the activity of God in Christ in a genuine historical contextual framework. He, he, uh, Jesus doesn't come from the land of Nod. He, he uh, doesn't come from some made up uh, mythological uh, <coughs> uh, region and or land. No, there's a certain historicity here. Jesus comes from the region of Galilee and the city of Nazareth, okay? Real historical uh, realities contained in Eretz Israel or in the land of Israel. So he's not some sort of a mythical creature or some mythical fictional personality. No, Jesus is a real historical documented human being coming from a real documented region and city in the land of Israel, okay? So Mark wants to place Jesus <coughs> in human history and, and in the history of Israel. So we read as follows. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the river Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heaven and the spirit descending like a dove upon him and a voice from heaven saying, you are my son, my beloved, with you I am well pleased. <clears throat> okay, now this is a very important dynamic literary uh, story of an actual historical event. Normally, whenever you had God manifesting his divine presence, whether it be in the Torah or the historical books in the canon of the uh, Hebrew scriptures or in the prophetic tradition, there's always going to be some sort of mediation. So for example, the giving of the Torah or the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. There's, the, there's Mount Sinai, the cloud, thunder, lightning, darkness, and then God appears as light coming from this cloud of absolute darkness. And they hear the roar of trumpet indicating God is self-revealing, okay? Well, he, so there's always going to be some sort of intermediary. Here, it's very different. He was baptized in the River Jordan by John, and just as, as he was coming up from the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. What does that mean? First of all, just in terms of uh, literary motif or images used in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis chapter one, <clears throat> the spirit of God, the Ruha of God is rustling over the waters of creation. So there, 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 there is an absolute connection between spirit and water. Okay, so the Ruha, the breath, the spirit of God is rustling over the water. And it's the spirit that basically uh, fertilizes, impregnates the water. Okay, so here we have Jesus in water and the clouds, the firmament, the air. There is a profound separation. Unlike Sinai, where there are clouds, and that's how God manifests himself, 
there's no impediment. The, the revelatory self-disclosure of Jesus and who Jesus is by God, who is Father, is now direct and imminent. There's no intermediary. There is no barrier. There is no separation. It's a clear revelatory self-disclosure of, of, of what <coughs> who and what God is through his son Jesus. So just as Jesus comes out of the water, the spirit, the ruha comes upon him. Okay. So that means every action that Jesus is going to do or perform is going to be spirit filled. You have to understand that. Okay. And he saw the heavens torn asunder, torn apart, and, and the spirit descending upon him. <clears throat> There's no more hindrance. There's no more separation. There's clear, authentic, legitimate self-disclosure of what who and what God is. And the person who is the means of this expression. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, my beloved, with you I am well pleased. So right from the very beginning, right in right when there is the actual messianic inauguration of who Jesus is as the beloved son coming from the father, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Why is that said? It, it's said because during the, uh, the two and a half years or three years of the ministry of Jesus, there are some people that are not going to find him pleasing. But however, from the beginning, from the baptism of Jesus, Jesus is the beloved of the Father. And the Father finds him absolutely pleasing. He is that pleasing element, the, that pleasing manifestation, the, the very unfolding of God's self as son. So as the son is the exact uh, replication of the father, the son now reveals exactly who the father is and what the father is about. Because what is true of the father by way of nature, by way of substance, by way of reality is now going to be true of his son, whom the father recognizes as his beloved son with whom he is well pleased. So whatever the son is going to say, is going to mirror the exactitude of veracity and truthfulness coming from the Father. That's who the Son is. That darling, in fact, the Hebrew is the Yabid Yadid, my beloved darling, the one who mirrors me perfectly, authentically, legitimately, and now is going to express with authority, whatever I tell him. Because his words are going to be my words. So if you are going to hear him, you are actually hearing me through him. That's why he is well pleased. Why? Because he's now been imbued taken over, possessed by the love of God, which is the spirit. The Holy Spirit or the spirit of God, the Ruha of God, the breath of God is the love that the God, that God the Father has toward the Son and the love the Son has toward the Father. That is in fact the gift and power and the activity of the spirit pure efficacious love of father to son 
and son to father. That's what Jesus is. One who has been possessed by the very love of Abba, father. The God who spoke to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The God who spoke through Moses in the burning bush has a son. And that son, that voice, that word that Moses heard in the burning bush, the voice that Abraham heard as God gave his covenant to Israel, that word both Abraham and Moses heard, and in the case of Moses saw in the burning bush, we believe that word took on flesh in the incarnation of the Logos, the very mind, the very will, the very word, the very law of God, that's what Logos means, M multiple definitional structures, okay, took on flesh. That's what, that's what we hold. That's why Jesus is the beloved son. He is the exact representation of the father as seen in the letter to the Hebrews. So at this particular juncture, he is completely possessed by the spirit and as a, and as a faithful Israelite will undergo what Israel historically in its own tradition and its own heritage had to go through. So, for example, when Moses receives the word of God coming from the burning bush, uh, he then goes to Egypt land, confronts Pharaoh, and demands that Pharaoh let the children of Israel proceed in to the desert wilderness to offer sacrifice. And, and we all know the story, that's not going to happen. But finally, it does happen after the 10 plagues, okay? And at this particular juncture, Israel has to face itself. She, Israel goes into the desert wilderness and confronts her God confronts each other, tries to make sense of who we are as God's people and what is this God like that has called us to be his own very own children, his very own possession. We belong to him and he belongs to us. We are his, his unique possession, not as chattel, not as something to be bought and sold, not uh, something that, uh, that has been objectified, but rather, no, uh, 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 we are possessed by God. And that's the imagery. That, 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 that is the historical imagery that God is married to Israel and Israel is married to God. God, is, God possesses Israel as a husband possesses his wife not as chattel, not as a thing, not as something objectifying, no. It's so intimate that we belong to each other. So that's the imagery here. Israel is possessed by God. He, she is loved by God, bride to bridegroom, okay? But like anything else, when you're forced out into the desert wilderness, you have to come to grips with yourself, your own identity, or understanding of who, who has in fact called us and what is this God like that has called us. And how do we proceed from that? Well, in Mark's gospel, it's the testing or the temptation of Jesus. It's found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew and Luke have a very long, uh, dynamic uh, presentation of this uh, 
uh, awful temptation by the evil one, by Satan. In Mark, it's absolutely shortened. Uh, Mark just simply says the following. This is Mark chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. And the spirit immediately drove them out into the desert wilderness. Now you're going to find this constantly <coughs> as one of the attributes in the Markan tradition. The issue of immediacy. Everything is happening fast. Everything. God is breaking through human history, human culture, the history of Israel. And he's manifesting himself, self-disclosing who and what he is to his own children and uh, later on to the entire universe. And it's immediate, it's quick. There's no delay, okay? So here, the spirit immediately drove him out in the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and angels waited on him. And the uh, temptation, that's it. See, like Israel, Jesus is an Israelite who is faithful to God. So as Israel was tempted by the evil one and had to deal with all sorts of issues in their relationship with each other and with God and with those that were not God-like, uh, uh, Jesus faces it. Now, in Matthew and Luke, there is, there is a further explication of what that meant and what he goes through. Mark simply does not have it. So, so Matthew, which copies Mark, and then Luke copies Matthew, um, extrapolates on what this was. Okay. Now, in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee. Now we have the first preaching. So he is tempted by the evil one, just like Israel was, because Jesus is that faithful Israelite, okay? After John is arrested, if you ever want some sort of a formula for the, for the gospel of Mark, of what Jesus preaches and teaches, stay tuned, this is it. After, he's after John is arrested, Jesus comes on the scene in Galilee and does five things. These are the five things. Proclaiming the good news of the gospel of God, saying, this is the time of fulfillment, the second. The third, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And then the fifth, believe in the gospel. Those are the five points. So he comes to proclaim the good news or the gospel of God. Saying this is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and therefore believe. Let's go through that. Okay. Proclaiming the good news of God or the gospel of God. What does that mean? It means that, that for all practical purposes, <coughs> it means that God exists. There is a God. The world has meaning. The, the universe has meaning. This is not haphazard. This is not an accident. Existence is not accidental. It's real. There's a plan behind it. There's a purposefulness for why we do the things that we do and why we even, even exist. We have meaning. There's a value to our existence. We may not necessarily see it all the time, but there is an absolute value that we exist. 
And there is a value to the universe. There is a value to earth. There is a value to every single person that God has ever created or, or every single thing that God has created. There, there, there is a value to Israel and the history of Israel, the heritage of Israel. So Jesus preaches the gospel of God, namely the good news that there is a God that has everything under control and we are wonderfully cherished by him. We get our identity, we get our meaning from him. There is a purple, there, there is a purpose for us. There's a reason for us. So whatever we go through, we don't go through it alone. There's not one moment of our human existence that is devoid of God's gracious presence. And that's the good news. Human existence, the, the existence of the entire universe has meaning, has purpose, has a value. <coughs> and Jesus, God's beloved son, now tells us what that purpose is. Then he says the following, saying, the time of fulfillment is now at hand. This is why we go back to Malachi and Isaiah. John the Baptist preaching, you know, we've been waiting for the Goel, the, the, the vindicator for Israel. John is saying, this is the time. What Israel has been praying for, for centuries, for a redeemer, now is the time. It's going to be fulfilled. What, what Israel has been hoping for is now going to take place. The Messiah is coming. In fact, not coming, he is at hand. In fact, the Messiah has been baptized and institutes and inaugurates the Messianic age. What Israel has been praying for, hoping for, in all its suffering and, 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 and in all its joy, is now being fulfilled. So this is a time of fulfillment. So the good news is there's a God. He said he's coming. He, he promised to send a Goel, a vindicator that would rid Israel of his enemies. It's happening. And it's immediate. Because why? Because this is the kingdom of God. Now, of all the things that Jesus uses in the synoptic tradition of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and also John, I might add, one of the key images or themes is the kingdom of God. He never defines the term. However, he will, he will talk about it parabolically. He will use signs and symbols indicating what the kingdom of God is, okay? And what we can tell from these parabolic discourses is that the kingdom of God is how God is present and active in human history, but most specifically in the history of Israel. The way God acts is the way he's present. The way God is present is the way he acts. That's the kingdom of God. And so for us Christians, as well as Jews, as, as, as well as anyone else, the kingdom of God is wherever God is. Well, wherever God is, is the universe. So where's the kingdom of God? Where is the first manifested? creation of the universe, creation of the planet Earth, the creation of humankind, the creation of Adam and Eve, the human race, human culture, human history, the specificity of the history of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, 
the exile, the Torah, the coming of Moses, Mount Sinai, the giving of the Torah, the prophets, the writings, the judges, the kings of Israel, the prophets of Israel, the Messiah of Israel, and the Pentecostal unveiling, uh, unveiling of God's definitive plan after Jesus at Pentecost and the institution of the body of Christ, the church. It's all the kingdom of God. Wherever God is present, that's how he acts. However, wherever he acts, there is his presence and that's the kingdom. And in order to understand that kingdom, you have to come to your senses. That's what we mean by the term repentance, coming to your senses, changing your disposition. It means metanoia, a changing of heart. So to repent, in, 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 in order to understand the gospel of God, that this is the time of fulfillment, that the kingdom of God is at hand, you got to change your disposition. And anything that is in any way opposite from God's mercy and justice has to be cleared away. So that the final characteristic, namely, believe in the good news, faith, in order to understand the kingdom of God, the gospel of God, that this is a time of fulfillment, and that you've got to change your disposition, that presumes you believe in the good news. There, there is that faith disposition. How can God manifest himself to you if you steadfastly refuse the possibility that he even exists? So faith is absolutely necessary. And a change of heart is absolutely necessary to understand the gospel of God being fulfilled in the kingdom of God, who is Jesus in your life. The actual specificity of your life, how you choose to live and why you choose to live it, somehow that's gonna manifest the kingdom of God, the presence of God, and the gospel of God. So that's what I would like to leave you with, you know, those five points. He's preaching the gospel of God. This is a time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And number five, believe in the gospel. If you want to know what Jesus came to be and to say and to deliver, those are the points. Ultimately, we do have meaning. There is a purpose for our existence. And we are wonderfully cherished by God. I believe it's time for a question and answer. Jay, please begin. Thank you, Father Jude. You're welcome. Now, speaking of the time of fulfillment, it is time to fulfill any questions you might have at this time for Father Jude. Um, <coughs> I see that there's already a question from Riley. So Riley, if you're present, um, you can go ahead and unmute and um, ask the question that you typed in the chat. Can you hear me, Riley? Okay. Oh, oh, there we go. Riley, can you hear me? Yes. Want me to just say it? Okay, go oh, ahead. Yeah, go ahead and read your question. Yeah, let's see. Hold on. Let me just... Let's have, so Gospel Mark is basically Jesus story in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, when we talk about the gospel, it is a actual, authenticated, historical document based on the life experience of Israel as Israel experienced Jesus of Nazareth. So it's not some sort of a mythological fairy tale. Absolutely not. It is an actual historical document that, that really authentically, legitimately recalls the history of Israel 
as it relates to this person, Jesus, coming from Nazareth. So it's not some sort of a fictional tale. It, uh, I'll be honest, it isn't made up. It's not a story. It's not a myth. It's not a fictionalized story. No, uh, uh, Jesus actually existed. Israel actually exists. And Israel encountered this Jesus. And the Gospel of Mark records some of those events in which there was a certain significance in the life of Israel as it encountered Jesus of Nazareth. All right. Thank you, Riley, for your question. And thank you, Father Jude. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, I'm going to open it up and... Uh, Virginia, it looks like you got a question that's burning there. So go ahead and unmute. Father, yes. Um, I was wondering, you know, when at mass we say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Yes. I've always, well, in my heart, I always thought that blessed is he would be us that comes yeah. in the name. Okay. Of the Lord. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that. That citation comes from the gospel tradition as Jesus comes in Jerusalem as the long awaited Messiah. So blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So it refers to Jesus. And in so far as we are disciples of Jesus and we come in his name, we come therefore in the name of the Father through his son Jesus. So hopefully our actions and our and our words exemplify the words of Christ himself. So blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord, namely Jesus, and as his followers, we say and do the words of Jesus and the actions of Jesus. So blessed are we too. But just in terms of the literary um, definitional structure of that citation, it refers to Jesus coming in the name and, and activity of his own father. But that's a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Father Jude, and thank you, Virginia. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open up the floor for anyone from uh, St. Francis Parish in Bakersfield. If you have a question, please activate your camera and raise your hand, or you can click the uh, raise hand button. All right, and now if we have questions from anyone that's outside of St. Francis and Bakersfield, you are welcome to ask a question as well. Hello, Father, this is Victor. Victor, yeah. Hi, Victor, yeah. good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good to see uh, you. Okay, just one, uh, a couple of questions that th went through yeah. my mind is you're reading the, uh, the baptism of Jesus. And uh, so um, when they, when uh, you said Mark is immediate, things happen very quickly, doesn't very drag quick. it out. Yeah. Um, and then he said, now you said he dispatched Satan right away. So he's there for 40 days. So are you saying that right off the bat, the interpretation is that psh, you get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you see, this, this is where, hey, Victor, yeah, this is where Matthew and Luke wants to elongate it and say, okay, what happened? Okay, and there are the three, uh, there are three levels of uh, testing, uh, you know, uh, and, and Mark simply wants to say, uh, like Israel, Israel was tempted by the evil one. Matthew follows Mark, Luke follows Matthew, and then they both and then both of them exemplify what was this <clears throat> testing about, you know. But so so obviously uh, there was a certain tradition in Mark uh, that perhaps uh, for whatever reason uh, he did. Either he did not know of it, or he simply uh, did not wish to exemplify it. However, 
Matthew wanted to exemplify and Luke followed suit. So, so and, 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 this, and this is why um, in the gospel tradition, even though it is a parallel narrative, you know, when you put all three together, there's a certain parallelization. Uh, this is why many scholars would say Mark is the earliest one because he doesn't exemplify that which Matthew and Luke did. So obviously uh, there was a multiple tradition out there. So there was the tradition that Mark got, most scholars would say that Mark gets his information from Peter, okay? And that Matthew and Luke copy Mark. But there's another tradition out there that maybe Mark didn't have or or Peter did not have, but Matthew and Luke had had, and then used it to exemplify and to elongate the actual narrative. So this is why, you know, when you look at the gospels, it's a gathering of different disjointed oral traditions of the charismatic message, the charisma, the good news about the coming of the kingdom of God, which Jesus preaches, that's what I mean by the term uh, charisma, the good news about the kingdom of God. Well, obviously there are many different facets of it. Some are written in this gospel, others are written in other, other New Testament documentation. So yeah, so so it, it, it this gets into how the gospels were even written. So there is the Christ event; <clears throat> he preaches and teaches. The words and actions received by the apostolic witnesses, by his disciples, by the crowd, the family of Jesus, the Herodians, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They hear, they think, they understand. It goes through a period of discernment, reflection, and further interpretation. And then later, these logia or these traditions are gathered, coalesced, put together, arranged, and then written down. So it's a, so uh, why Mark would leave certain things out and then Matthew and Luke would add them back in, who knows? Again, um, uh, perhaps there was a certain need in the Lucan and Matthean um, audience that wanted a further extrapolation of what happened when Jesus was, was uh, being tempted. And in the uh, Markan congregation or in the Markan writing itself, uh, there was no need to do that. So that's why it's always good to have all the sources with you. So when you look at the Gospel of Mark, so for example, here for, Z, for, for me, for example, this is how I would read it. So I have the parallel narratives. So you have Mark, but then you have uh, Matthew and Luke. So you can look side by side and say, well, see, Mark has only this, but Matthew and Luke have something totally different. Why is that? There must have been a secondary tradition that is valid. Uh, and so it tends to exemplify a further understanding of uh, how the Gospels were, in fact, written. Thank you, Victor. Thanks, Victor. Um, there's time for one more question from Maria. Maria, if you would go ahead and unmute. OK, Maria. Good afternoon, Father. I'm joining you from Connecticut and very grateful to have found you and be able to hear the series. Um, Thank you. I have a very small question. One thing I wonder about is 
uh, Mark makes a point of mentioning that he came, uh, he went to Galilee. Uh, so where was he before? Is is there any fuller meaning to that? Did it just mean that he went from John to Galilee or? Yeah, you know? what it basically means is that Mark wants to place Jesus in actual historical history. So he came from the region of Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, because most of the confrontational issues in the Marcan tradition will take place outside of Galilee. Now, when we start hitting Mark chapter two, there are the five conflictual stories in the first part of the gospel of Mark that all deal when he's up in Galilee, but later when he goes down to Judea in the South, there's a whole another issue that he has to deal with. But Mark simply wants to say, you know something? Jesus was born in Bethlehem, uh, the parents of Jesus, and Jesus had to run for their lives because of King Herod, after the death of Herod, and when Archelaus is in Bethlehem, they say, we can't even stay in Judea, we need now to go to Galilee, so they live, move to Galilee, and that's where Jesus grows up, and then at the age of 30 plus or minus years, he begins his ministry and uh, he goes down to Judea. He's baptized in the River Jordan. Uh, he inaugurates the Messianic age and he goes back to Galilee and starts to preach the good news. So yeah, uh, Mark wants to place him in real genuine human history. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Father Jude, and uh, we hope you can join us tonight for our evening meeting. All the information is on our website, stdominics.org slash father.jude, and you can also email additional questions to ronaldjudeeli at gmail.com. Thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Bye, everyone. Bye.